So the first week I talked about uh, the science of climate change. I talked about emission scenarios, options for emission reduction costs of emission reduction. And the second week I talked about uh, the impacts of climate change. And this, in the third week, uh, I'm going to put the two together <coughs> and essentially do optimal climate policy, optimal emission. The sequencing is a bit unfortunate. Um, there's a logical next step from first best climate policy would be to go into uh, international environmental agreements, uh, but it has been done already, right? Uh, so we won't go there. Uh, instead, I will stick to uh, sort of unitary uh, decision maker. Uh, and then it would have been better had Stephen come uh, next week with international environmental agreements. <coughs> So for the next six hours, essentially, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm only going to do two hours today. Uh, for the next six hours, I'm going to talk about how much, by how much to reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions. I'm actually going to start with uh, international law and the carbon cycle before going into efficient uh, solutions. The text that you see displayed here uh, is from Article 2 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that was negotiated in 1992 in Rio. And that article sets out the ultimate objection, uh, ultimate objective uh, of international climate policy. The UNFCCC, uh, as I said, was negotiated in 1992. It's been ratified by most countries on the planet, I think North Korea and the Dutch are holding out. Uh, but other than that, everybody uh, has accepted this and therewith implicitly or implicitly transposed this into national law as well. So the ultimate objective of this convention is to achieve stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. So the level should be achieved within a time frame sufficient to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to ensure the food production is not threatened and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. So what did we just agree? Most of the stuff in Article 2 is wishy-washy. There's just a lot of weasel words. Yeah. As I said, the, the, the UNFCCC has been adopted uh, by all countries, uh, basically all countries in the world. Uh, you can sort of imagine that they would like to sign up uh, to this. Right? So the aim of the convention is to avoid danger, which is always good. Uh, make sure that nature is not in trouble and make sure that we have enough to eat. Uh, and at the same time, uh, our economies continue to grow. What's not to like? It contains something for everybody. And if you just look at the second sentence, it just has no priority, right? It says economic growth is important. Food is important, nature is important, everything is important, and everything is equally important. And you can interpret this in any way you want. You can use this to justify very stringent climate policy, and you can also justify this, uh, use this to justify very lenient climate policy. Because it says stabilization, but it doesn't say stabilization at a particular level. Right? It just says climate change will have to stop at some point. Now, unbeknownst to uh, the authors of Article 2, that is actually not true, what I did. Article 2 has radical implications for climate policy, uh, that nobody who signed up to this or the people who wrote this text uh, did not realize. Um, and that follows from the carbon cycle. So if the uh, concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, M, follows a linear difference equation uh, that is displayed here. Um, essentially, the concentration at time T is slightly less than the concentration uh, at time T minus 1, plus however much we put uh, additionally into the atmosphere. If that is our conceptualization of the um, carbon cycle. Then what do we know uh, about the implications for stabilization of stabilization for emissions? Well, we can simply uh, work out these equations in steady state. Uh, so what does steady state mean? Right? It means that 
uh, concentration of time t is equal to concentration of time t minus 1. <coughs> then we don't change anymore, right? Uh, or alternatively, drop the subscripts from the top equation. Uh, and then we have m is delta m plus e, which implies that m equals e over 1 minus delta. So if this is the way you think about the carbon cycle, then the fact that we want to keep m constants only implies that we should keep e constant, right? So we should at some point uh, go for constant uh, emissions. But it doesn't say anything about the level that e and therefore m should be. This thinking is wrong. And that follows from uh, the way the carbon cycle works. I've shown you uh, this cartoon before. Uh, we're looking at uh, the stops and flows of CO2 uh, in that different uh, stocks in different reservoirs on the planet flows between different reservoirs. Uh, we have the ocean, and the deep ocean, and the sediments, uh, we have terrestrial vegetation, we have stops of fossil fuels, and of course, uh, primarily, uh, of our interest in amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. I did not talk about the leftmost arrow. What you see is that every year a teeny tiny amount of CO2, 2 to be exact, uh, get it on the carbon, uh, <coughs> is taken up by what is here described as weathering. The, the carbon cycle uh, is, is a fairly complex piece. There's all sorts of reasons, as you see here, there's all sorts of reasons why carbon ends up, the carbon dioxide ends up in the atmosphere and why it's taken out. Um, and one of the processes through which CO2 is depleted from the atmosphere is geological. And essentially the way to think about this, and it's through uh, the weathering of rock, uh, essentially the way to think of this is that part of the CO2 in the atmosphere is taken away from uh, the atmosphere at the rate at which rocks grow. And for humans, that is very, very slow. None of them have ever seen a rock grow. But they do, right? Very, very, very slowly. <clears throat> now, if you turn this into a uh, mathematical formulation, this goes back to uh, the works, the work of Ansari Meyer Neiman and Klaus Hasselmann, is that mathematically, the best way of describing the carbon cycle is not through a single first order difference equation, but rather through five first order difference equations. And the total concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, M, is uh, the sum of its components, M uh, sub i. And then each of the components evolves according to their own uh, according to their own dynamics, that is, each has their own depreciation constant, uh, delta. Um, and of course, each take their own share of the emissions, uh, alpha e, where some of the alphas add up to uh, 1. So far, I haven't changed things, right? But, because part of this CO2 is removed from the atmosphere through geological processes, and therefore at the geological time scale, for all practical purposes, one of the deltas in this equation, delta 5 in this notation, equals 1. That is, on a human time scale, this CO2 is not depreciated. The associated alpha is 13%. So 13% of the CO2 that we put in the atmosphere stays in the atmosphere forever. Or on a human time scale. Forever. Now, what, what happens if delta is zero, if delta is one in this equation? We're in trouble, right? We do n is e over one minus one e over zero. That doesn't work. Doesn't mean that there's no solution to this equation. Because there is an alternative solution. Uh, and that is if uh, delta is one, then m is n plus e. If E is zero, we're fine. So <coughs> the words that our dear leaders uh, put in Article 2 of the UNF uh, Triple C, stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations, implies that at least for CO2, the old 
is by setting emissions to zero. And that is what we've all signed up for, right? Or rather, these and volunteers, right? In the very long run, the only way to stabilize the climate is to drive emissions to zero. We're not talking about 80% emission reduction, we're not talking about 90% emission reduction, we're not talking about 99% emission reduction, we're talking about 100% emission reduction. That means that we need to drive fossil fuels out of their final needs. And when I talked about emission reduction four weeks ago, I said that some emission reduction is simple, right? A lot of energy wasted, and uh, we can achieve a lot by switching from one source of energy to the other. If you want to reduce more, it becomes uh, more complicated, and so on and so forth. But to go up after the last liter of petrol, that is very, very difficult uh, to achieve. Right? It's a bit unclear what is uh, the ultimate uh, needs application of fossil fuels. It will probably be in helicopters or in aircraft, or maybe in spacecraft, uh, where it's very hard to imagine uh, coming up with a biofuel that is actually packs enough power to do so. Uh, to do what fossil fuels are doing, but it's, uh, it's very hard to imagine a world where there's really no uh, use for fossil fuels whatsoever. So that's the politics of climate change. Let's look at this from an economic angle. What do we want to do? Uh, we want to derive optimal climate policy. Uh, that is, we want to maximize uh, social welfare. How do we do that? Uh, in a static optimum, uh, it's very simple, right? Uh, marginal cost should equal marginal benefits. That follows from the first order conditions uh, of any optimum, uh, and that is what we should do, where in this case, marginal costs are the marginal cost of uh, emission reduction and the marginal benefit are uh, the benefits of avoiding a little bit of climate change. Now, we're not talking about a static problem at all, we're talking about a dynamic problem, but actually a lot of the intuition uh, a lot of the intuition uh, carries over from uh, the static to the dynamic. Um, so uh, we're talking about the stock pollutants, right? So the benefits are essentially stock that depend on the accumulation uh, of greenhouse gases over time. Uh, the costs are a flow. Let's assume that to the detriment really the cost of flow is relative to the uh, benefits. Um, then first order condition is the marginal costs at any time. Uh, should equal the net present value of the marginal benefits at any time. So mathematically in static optimum, uh, we say we want to maximize W as a function of uh, E. Uh, so we choose our emissions or our emission reduction effort, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's the difference between the benefits that avoiding these emissions brings and the costs uh, that doing so incurs. Um, Non-constrained optimization, right? So we simply say that uh, dWdE equals zero, from which it follows that dDdE minus dCdE equals zero, or dDdE equals dCdE, right? This is all standard, or it should be standard. That's not uh, a proper representation of climate, right? What we really want to do is maximize the effort of welfare, effort of welfare. Uh, is the sum over t from today till the entire future, where uh, perhaps the best way of conceptualizing climate policy um, is to say that we're optimizing things at time zero, that is today, we're looking over the entire future, indexed by t, at every point in the future, uh, we choose our emissions e, right, that incurs a cost c, that just depends on what we do at that point in time, that's instantaneous. But the same is not true for the benefits of emission reduction. They depend on what we do at that point in time, what we did the year before, what we did the year before that, and that is because CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere. Uh, so B is a function of E, BT is a function of ET, and instantaneous, and the entire history of uh, e, uh, before that until today, right? It's also a function of what happened in the past, the past is not controlled, right? So, <coughs> if you take the first part of the derivative of this thing to uh, a choice, and now it's a dynamic problem, so we have to do this at every point in time, what we find 
is well, we have an instantaneous dependence of our costs on uh, our emissions. So the C, the E just stays the same because we have to add a subscript T uh, to that. So the right hand side of the uh, first order condition hasn't changed. The left hand side has changed. And the same thing what enters there is the B, the E, just as we had it before. But now the B, the E at time T. Now the instantaneous effect, the B T plus one to D E T, the effect in a year from now, plus the D T plus two D E D T, two years from now, and then into the entire future. Right? So we have to do uh, at T plus S there. But of course now we're looking into the future, so we should discount uh, those impacts with uh, the rate of discount one plus R. And that should, of course, be raised to the distance in time, which is leaving out of this S. It's still marginal cost equal marginal benefits. It's just that the marginal benefits are now no longer instantaneous, but it's the net present value of a stream of marginal benefits discounted to today. Right? Four weeks ago, I showed you this table with the marginal costs of greenhouse gas emission reduction. You undoubtedly recall. Here we see the same thing depicted uh, graphically, where uh, the black line in the middle is the median across the models that I showed, and then the grayer lines are the 76 and the 95 uh, percent confidence interval. Um, and it's here given as a function, so uh, on the Horizontal axis, we're looking at the concentration of greenhouse gases in the year 2100. And on the uh, vertical axis, <coughs> we're looking at the carbon tax that we should apply in the year um, 2015. That's today, right? It wasn't today I made this graph, uh, but it is today now. Slightly old representation if you're a mathematician, a perfectly normal representation if you're an economist, right? So the cause is on the horizontal axis. Um, and the consequences on the um, vertical axis. And typically we think of the problem as follows. If we apply a carbon tax, where would we end up with our emissions? But here I invert the problem and say, if we want to achieve a certain atmospheric concentration, what is the carbon tax that we should uh, apply? Right? That's why the axes uh, are where they are. And I prefer to think as a mathematician rather than an economist uh, if it comes to making graphs. Um, <clears throat> nobody's stopping me right after that. If you want to know what the hell I'm on about, look up the Convention of Paris uh, in the 19th century. Uh, the vertical graph uh, axis is uh, exponential, right? So, or logarithmic, sorry. So the curve that is here shown to be linear is in fact exponential. And what you see is that uh, if you want to achieve uh, an atmospheric concentration of 700 uh, parts per million, then you should apply a carbon tax of around 6 or $7 per ton of carbon. If instead you want to go for 600 parts per million, you should apply a carbon tax of 70. Um, or thereabouts, if you want to go to 500, then you should apply a carbon tax of uh, roughly $1,500 uh, per ton. Right, that is how to read at uh, this point. So this is in a way the supply uh, function of uh, emission reduction. Last week we looked at the marginal damage costs of, of carbon dioxide emissions. You may recall this graph. Uh, this is for a 3% pure rate of plant reference. So it's the carbon given in green, uh, the CO2 test given in red. So this or the difference between applying this carbon tax, just evaluating it along a uh, distance as usual path. What you see is that the carbon tax for a 3% pure rate of plant reference, the 5% discount rate, should be in the order of $25 per ton of carbon, something like that. So this is the price we are willing to pay for climate policy. Oh, wrong uh, button. And this will tell you how far that will get us. So if we pay $25 per ton of carbon, 
Where do we end up? Number six, seven, five. The stated aim of the European Union, and that's official policy, as well as a lot of the rhetoric in uh, the United Nations climate negotiations. And it was sort of adopted, but perhaps not uh, during the Lima negotiation, um, is to go for two degrees warming as the eventual aim, that's sort of the maximum tolerable warming. But we want to have a 50 50 chance of getting there, and um, we need to keep conservation to go for 50. So that we apply a carbon effect at $700. So you're beginning to get a feeling where this is heading, right? This is just the carbon tax or the PIGU tax, the amount we uh, are willing to pay for a 5% discount rate uh, in the year 2010 or 2015. Here we're looking at an evolution of this over time. Roughly people reckon that this number that I just showed grows by about 2% per year. And that's what you see here. These are results uh, from Northhouse's Dice model where he shows the carbon, the optimal carbon tax, and this is a the good tax uh, evolving over time. So we started roughly the same number as I just showed, and then we just uh, raised it slightly over time at around 2% per year. And um, if we apply that carbon tax, then the following happens to the concentration. In black, you're looking at a situation without climate policy. In green, you're looking at a situation where we apply the optimal carbon tax. Now what you see is that yes, the concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases is lower as a result of the climate policy. And this is the optimal scenario. It is in the interest of the greatest good for the greatest number uh, to reduce greenhouse gases. But if we apply North Hunter's model, we get nowhere near anything that resembles stabilization. What we do in the optimal run is to slow down the growth rate, but we don't bring it to zero. This is an old result. Uh, it was first, <laughs> that's actually a hard question. When was it first published? Preliminary versions of this were published between 1982 and 1991, but this result was first published in 1992, uh, and it caused a bit of a stir, as you uh, could imagine. And not everybody uh, immediately embraced it. Um, and essentially, North Out asked the question if the world were ruled by a benevolent dictator, what would she do? It's a bit of a silly question to ask, right? The world is not ruled by a benevolent dictator. The world uh, does not have a dictator as to start with. And if the world were to have a dictator, why would we assume that she would be benevolent? But let's put ourselves sort of in the uh, ivory uh, tower position where we have this uh, Galadriel uh, running the world and uh, think how sort of. Seeking the best uh, for all of us, right? But essentially, what Nordhaus included is three, three things, right? So, a little emission reduction in the beginning. We start with a low carbon tax. Then, carbon tax goes up over time. Some more emission reduction later, but not enough to stabilize concentration. Now, as I said, this caused a bit of a stir. People were not in the least happy with this conclusion. And as a result, since 1992, uh, scores of people have tried to overturn this result, right? Uh, trying different models, different parameterizations, different assumptions. It turned out that if you go through that large literature, that nobody has seriously challenged the green part of the conclusion. That is, that any optimal climate policy starts slow. The reasons go back to what I said about the optimal dynamics of an abatement program, right? Because we are locked into decisions of the past, because uh, capital, uh, the, the capital stock that we use to turn energy into useful things is so long lived that any sort of radical program of rapid emission reduction would just lead to huge debt rate losses in the economy uh, without doing much about emission. Short term price elasticity of energy use and carbon dioxide is simply low. Uh, so, if you raise the carbon tax too fast, you're just 
causing economic pain without reducing emissions. And for that reason, basically everybody in their right mind has concluded that whatever you want to do later, you always want to start slow. And of course, political constraints also mean that if you're going to introduce a new tax, then it's much easier to start at a point where it doesn't cost too much. The second part of Nordhaus's conclusion turns out to be very sensitive to uh, assumptions in the model. If you use a lower discount rate, you want to accelerate faster. If you use a different carbon cycle model, you may want to uh, accelerate faster. If you use a different uh, impact function of either climate policy or climate change, you may want to accelerate faster or slower, um, and so on and so forth. They are essentially it's up for grabs, right? You can come up with a credible assumption that gives you a uh, different uh, result. The third part of Nordhaus's conclusion that it is an optimal policy will not lead to uh, stabilization, regardless of what the international law says, is actually robust. And this follows. It's from the structure of cost-benefit analysis. And it's easily uh, understood if you just pretend for a moment that column is static. Mm -hmm. And what you're looking at here is your standard cost-benefit analysis in the static context, right? So we have, uh, this is on the uh, horizontal axis, we have some indication of uh, welfare. Uh, on the vertical axis, what we have is that if there's uh, no emissions, there's nothing to worry about, uh, and then uh, the emissions uh, grow, uh, we get more and more concerns, uh, so that's the marginal, uh, actually you see labeled as well, uh, those are the marginal uh, social losses from emissions in green, and then in brown, what you're looking at is that it's sort of like stay with the status quo, we don't cure any costs, uh, so that is where the brown line uh, margin cluster uh, crosses uh, zero, uh, but then if you push emissions down, 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 the incur higher and higher costs at the market. And then you do this cost benefit analysis, then what we find is that as long as climate change is an externality and a negative externality, one that hurts people, then you would always want to reduce emissions to the point where the dotted line is, mm -hmm. and uh, to the point where the uh, brown line hits the green line, or the red line hits zero, that's the difference between the two. You want to reduce emissions to that point, which is lower than where they otherwise would have been, but it's not zero. And this just follows from the structure of cost benefit analysis. We almost always go for an interior solution. Why is this, right? A little bit of emission reduction is cheap, right? So you don't worry about it, so you can just push uh, emissions down without uh, worrying too much about the economic cost. A lot of emission reduction is expensive, right? You really want to go after the last ton of CO2 emitted, then you're up for uh, a big task. So the brown curve roughly has this one. It's the other way around for the benefits, right? So if without climate policy we end up in a world uh, that is six degrees warmer, and then through climate policy we push that from six degrees to five degrees, we probably make big savings, right? We take away a lot of uh, damage. But if we then push it from 5 degrees to 4 degrees, we take away less of a problem. If we push it from 4 degrees to 3 degrees, we take away less of a problem again. If we push it from 3 degrees to 2 degrees, 2 degrees to 1 degree, from 1 degree to 0.1 degree, stabilization means stabilization. So that means that we somehow have to justify not pushing climate change down from 6 degrees to 5 degrees, which I think is a case that can be easily made, but from 0.1 degree to 0.01 degree of warming, or from 0.01 degree to 0.001 degree of warming. And it's extremely difficult to imagine that if instead of having a global warming of 0.1 degree per century, we only have 0.05 degrees of warming per century, and that would make any significant difference to anybody. The impacts 
disappear at that point, they disappear into the noise. That means that the benefits disappear into the noise. And it is extremely difficult to come up with a justification of pushing emissions to zero. It's easy to make a justification of reducing emissions, but pushing them to zero is what would the marginal benefit be, right? And that is why a benefit cost anal uh, analysis will go for an interior solution. And an interior solution, because of the structure of the carbon cycle, makes stabilize emissions, but will never stabilize concentration. Uh, so we have a bit of a, uh, a problem here, namely that what all of our models say is in the best interest of our welfare, namely to reduce emissions but not by so much as to stabilize concentrations, runs flat in the face of what has been internationally agreed. Uh, there is a real tension between uh, what a cost-benefit analysis would tell you or a, a decision analysis or a welfare optimization would tell you. Uh, and what a lawyer would tell you, we have a blind person. Uh, there's one exception to this, and that is if, I have a hard time saying it always, if there were a carbon-free energy source out there, a so-called backstop technology in, in modeling terms. Um, and what a backstop technology does is that at a certain price, say a carbon tax uh, of $100 per ton of C, uh, would become competitive. So far, that's the standard assumption, right? If you both can't take $100 uh, per ton of C, uh, wind and solar become better. But that is not the only uh, characteristic of a backstop uh, technology. Also, the other assumption is that then it starts uh, to become uh, deployed, and it's limitless, and once it is deployed, deployed so that the economy moves to a new equilibrium, and this technology becomes competitive without policy support. So if you assume that, that because of some action that we're undertaking now, people go out and invent a carbon-free uh, energy technology that is competitive in the market, and that would not otherwise have been invented, then you can actually justify uh, stabilization. Right? Because as soon as we have the carbon-free energy technology, that is, as abundant and as convenient uh, and as plentiful and as cheap as fossil fuels, then of course we change, right? Uh, then we just have cheaper energy, and that's what we want. Right? So then we don't need uh, subsidies or taxes or government support uh, to embrace this new technology. If there is such a silver bullet out there, and that silver bullet only comes about through climate policy, then indeed, uh, policy of taxation uh, would lead to stabilization uh, of the conservation of carbon dioxide and to stabilization, uh, zero emissions, and therefore no future climate change. I find backstop technology very hard to stomach. I promise that I will talk only about the third gas. There's one sentence here uh, about what would happen in an uh, international context, right? Uh, what I've looked at is what if the world were ruled by a benevolent dictator, but if we have many countries run by benevolent dictators, what would happen? Well, if they're all acting their own self interest, and of course, we understand the free rider problem, uh, you only care about the impact that fall on yourself, so you discount most of the impact that fall on others, and the only way that you can go from here in terms of emission reduction is down, is instead of taking into account the damages that your emission do to the entire world, you look at the damages done to your own country, then you have less damages to be worried about. And your optimal emission reduction would be lower, and the emission scenario would be closer to the one uh, without uh, any climate policy at all.